Good uh, afternoon, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, and uh, welcome uh, to the sixth and uh, final session uh, of uh, this uh, interesting Congress. I uh, apologize in advance for the quality of my English, but uh, I felt I could not refuse the kind invitation of my friend Professor Ferrer Betran to chair this meeting. Now uh, we are all uh, keen to hear the speakers of this uh, afternoon. And uh, now I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Frederick Schauer, professor at the University of Virginia, who will speak uh, on uh, evidence of wrongdoing versus uh, evidence of being a wrongdoer, or uh, rather, according to new title of the written text, Sanction for Acts and Section for Actors. Over to you, Professor Schauer. So before I begin, let me um, thank not only the organizers, Jordi Ferrer especially, for putting together a wonderful event. Uh, I was pleased and privileged to be part of the first event in this series eight years ago uh, that dealt with questions of analytic jurisprudence. I remember thinking at the time uh, that it was inconceivable in my country that there would be an audience of this size and this sophistication for an academic conference about legal philosophy. Uh, I am uh, equally pleased, equally grateful now, eight years later, once again, to have been included. Uh, and I'm also particularly grateful to all of you who are attending. So the title of this talk, this paper, uh, as just mentioned, uh, the question of sanctions for acts and or sanctions for acts versus sanctions for actors. So let me begin with a not so hypothetical example. Suppose that someone whom we can call Harvey has been accused by five different women of sexual assault or other forms of severe sexual misconduct. As is common in such instances, there were no witnesses to any of the alleged acts, nor is there any physical evidence. But each of the women, each of the accusers, presents a largely believable account and for each, it is an account that contains occasional inconsistencies, but is otherwise highly persuasive. In response to each of these accusations, Harvey offers a forceful denial. Again, each denial is somewhat believable and somewhat persuasive, but again contains some inconsistencies. Assume for the sake of the example, that each of the accusations taken in light of the denials and in light of the other available evidence and in light of the evidence, the inferences that we can draw from uh, evidence not presented is 80% likely to be true. Accordingly, if the individual accusations assessed individually were each to be the foundation of a criminal prosecution based solely on the single act alleged by a single accuser. And if the standard for conviction in a criminal prosecution were to be proof beyond a reasonable doubt 
often understood by those who like to add numbers to, su to such things to be in the vicinity of 0.95, then Harvey will be acquitted in each of these five prosecutions and as a consequence will not be subject to criminal sanctions. But now suppose we ask a different question and ask whether Harvey has committed at least one act of serious sexual misconduct. If this is the question, the statistics, the mathematics, the inferences now look very different. Assuming crucially that there is genuine statistical and empirical independence among the multiple accusations, the likelihood that Harvey has committed at least one of these acts is one minus 0.2 to the fifth which is, I don't imagine that you are doing the math right now, which is 0.999968, a likelihood which is, for all practical purposes, equivalent to absolute certainty. Thus, under circumstances in which it is a virtual certainty that Harvey has committed at least one act of sexual assault, that he is a sexual assaulter, he will be acquitted in five serial criminal prosecutions and will accordingly not be punished. What this outcome reveals about the justice system is the principal theme of this paper. So a related example, as is familiar, I suspect, to most people in this audience, in his 1977 book, The Probable and the Provable, the philosopher L. Jonathan Cohen presented what he described as the paradox of the gate crasher. Cohen asks his readers to imagine an event, a rodeo, uh, why Cohen um, from his uh, base in Oxford picked a rodeo, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but the, for the rodeo, there is a charge for admission. The organizers count those in attendance and the result is that there appear to have been 1,000 spectators at the rodeo. But it turns out that only 499 tickets were sold and presented. As a result, we are led to conclude that 501 of the spectators in attendance entered without tickets. There were 501 gate crashers, 501 spectators who entered fraudulently. Cohen then hypothesizes a civil lawsuit for damages by the rodeo organizers against any, one of, any single one of the 1,000 spectators. The organizers present evidence of the number of seated spectators and the number of tickets bought and presented, but no other evidence against the defendant. And then the question, Cohen's question, is why the organizers in a civil action in which the standard of proof for imposing liability is proof by a preponderance of the evidence should not be able to recover solely on the basis of the statistical evidence, given that the organizers appear to have proved their case to a probability of 0.501, complications aside, which indeed represents a preponderance of the evidence. Cohen takes his question to be rhetorical. That is, for him, it is self-evident that the organizers should not be able to recover on the basis of what the literature refers to as naked statistical evidence. And Cohen uses what he takes to be the patent impermissibility of such an outcome to ground an inquiry into just why it is that such an outcome is impermissible. But perhaps basing a judgment especially a judgment uh, in a civil action for damages, on statistics alone is not impermissible as all, at all, as some number of commentators, including myself, I might note, um, have argued over the years. If we understand all evidence as in some broad and loose sense probabilistic, there may be no uh, more or less likely to be true, more or less plausible, 
then there may be no defensible distinction between the evidence that comes from a not very reliable eyewitness, think of the talk that we have all just heard, the evidence that comes from a not very reliable eyewitness, and the evidence that comes from naked statistics having the same probabilistic likelihood of truth. More relevantly here, however, Cohen's engaging example may have led us down a false path. And the example has done so by seductively hypothesizing 501 identical wrongs. 501 gate crashers and thus 501 identical fraudulent entries. But the fact that the 501 wrongs are identical or seem to be identical turns out to be no more than a quirk of this particular example. So consider a different example. Suppose that in the month of December 2017, there were 100 murders committed in the city of New York. And suppose that a person, call him Smith, has been heard to say prior to December 2017 that he intended to commit a murder in New York in, two, in December 2017. And Smith has also been heard to say at a later date that he committed one of the 100 murders committed in New York uh, in December 2017. Smith is then prosecuted and there is no other evidence. Can Smith be convicted? Our initial reaction is that under the prevailing practices of most legal systems, Smith cannot be convicted. Smith would not be prosecuted simply for committing a murder or even one of 100 murders. He would have to be prosecuted for having committed a particular murder and could not be convicted unless there were sufficient evidence that he committed the particular murder he was charged with having committed. Or so we, or most legal systems in most developed countries believe. One can imagine similar examples of even greater specificity and thus, thus <clears throat> with numbers smaller than 100, but still greater than one. We would still say that we do not convict a person for having committed some robbery, some burglary, some arson, or some murder. A particular crime must be charged and a particular crime must be proved. Without identifying a particular crime or generally, subject to some exceptions, in civil contexts, a particular wrong, the prosecution or other legal action is a non-starter. Whether it be the murder example or Cohen's rodeo example, we typically require specification of which of the 100 murders or which of the 500 fraudulent entries provides the basis for the legal claim, whether that claim be by way of criminal prosecution or a civil action for damages. As a descriptive matter, if Cohen's example is to be representative of most actual legal systems, it would have to be proved to the relevant standard of proof that the defendant in any one lawsuit or any one action committed a particular fraudulent entry. The fact that there were 500 other fraudulent entries in the same general location and on the same day and even at approximately the same time is no more relevant than it would be in the prosecution for murder that there were 99 other murders in New York in the same month. Therefore, if we were initially to identify a particular fraudulent entry, the probability that a particular person among the spectators committed that particular fraudulent entry is no longer 0.501, it is one out of 1,000 or 0.001. That 500 other and very similar entries occurred on the same day and in the same place 
does not in any way increase the probability of this defendant having committed this wrong above 0.001. The other acts are logically and thus legally irrelevant and would not be admitted in evidence at most trials. Cohen's mistake is thus in supposing that the legal system starts with the person and then goes to the wrong, when in reality, it is just the opposite. And if it is necessary to identify a particular wrong at the outset, then the number of other wrongs that have occurred in locational and temporal proximity is of no legal relevance. Indeed, things become clearer once we realize that each fraudulent entry took place at a different moment, and each took place at a different, even if only by centimeters, place. The difference between Cohen's alleged paradox and the 100 murders in New York is only a matter of degree. And we exclude as legally irrelevant the other 500 fraudulent entries for the same reason that we exclude the other 99 murders in New York in December. My discussion of Cohen's gatecrasher paradox was intended to be largely descriptive of the prevailing practice and underlying assumptions in most common law and, I suspect, civil law jurisdictions. The argument just offered, or the uh, account just offered, was not intended to be normative. But we can now ask the normative question and inquire into why the legal system operates in this way and whether it should do so. Indeed, if we switch Cohen's example from the context of civil liability to that of criminal prosecution, and if we adjust the numbers so that there are 800 fraudulent entries out of 1,000 identified spectators in attendance, and consequently an 80% probability of guilt, then we have arrived in, from, by a different route at the case of Harvey. Thus, the question is whether the legal system can or should convict Harvey of having committed at least one sexual assault, even if the probability of him having committed a particular sexual assault on a particular accuser is less than the presumed 0.95 necessary to support a legitimate criminal conviction. For many people, the idea of sanctioning Harvey, or anyone else, for having committed an unspecified sexual assault or any other crime appears initially unjust or otherwise misguided. But it is possible that some or even much of the resistance to the idea of sanctioning for non-specified wrongs may be premised on a series of worries, a series of concerns that in the final analysis might not be dispositive or might not even be very much on point. So let me look more carefully at some possible objections. One objection stems from a set of evidentiary worries that are constructed around the paradigm case of the criminal defendant. And given the Blackstonian uh, maxim of better that 10 guilty persons escape than that one innocent suffer, it is not surprising, and in most contexts not troubling, that the principles of proof are heavily skewed to minimize false convictions, even at the even at the cost of increasing the number of false acquittals. But if the objection to criminal sanctions for having committed unspecified acts is based simply on a generalized and almost intuitive fear of increasing in any way the state's power to prosecute, it is worth considering that protections against state government, uh, state or government overreaching are already incorporated into some number of other procedural devices, including, in many jurisdictions, the presumption of innocence, the privilege against self-incrimination, the prohibition on double jeopardy, and additional restraints on police and prosecut 
prosecutorial practices. As the philosopher Larry Loudon has argued, adding additional prosecutorial hurdles may in some contexts be a form of double counting. As the example of Harvey suggests, however, it might be possible to create a system of sanctions for having committed an unspecified act without relaxing either the burden of proof or any of the other just mentioned protections for defendants in criminal prosecutions. Nevertheless, if we shift our attention from the criminal context to civil awards or sometimes administrative remedies, we are, in theory, as troubled by a non-award or non-recompense of any form to a wronged victim plaintiff as we are about an award uh, to a non-culpable defendant. And if we thus remove the specter of wrongful imprisonment and consequently the presence of pervasive defendant preferences, it becomes easier, as it was for Jonathan Cohen, to examine the issue more closely. Indeed, removing the distraction of the actual potential or simply feared totalitarian state makes open-mindedly examining the statistical and decision-theoretic issue at hand far more straightforward. But even in a civil context, a series of worries and potential objections looms. One is that most legal systems are, in general, averse to sanctioning people, civilly or criminally, for their character, as opposed to sanctioning them for the acts that that character may have caused, in a probabilistic sense of causation, them to commit. And one reason for the traditional aversion to character evidence, it is not the only reason, is that people with characters that might make them more likely than others to commit certain acts might still not commit those acts. And once the fear is characterized in terms of the possibility that people with certain characters may nevertheless not commit the acts that those characters might cause um, or non-causally indicate, there emerged the familiar worries and objections couched in the language of thought control, mind control, 1984, um, and much else. But although mind control might be frightening, the argument for aggregating wrongs, which is a label used by others for the claim that I am discussing here, the argument for aggregating wrongs is less an argument from thoughts than it is an argument from acts. Harvey, in my opening example, is not being sanctioned for what he was thinking, but for the aggregated probabilities of multiple acts. Moreover, the argument that someone with certain thoughts, motives, intentions, or proclivities might not actually co commit the acts they have thought about is in some tension with various crimes that are sometimes labeled as preparatory offenses. Possession of burglar tools, drug paraphernalia, and the like is, after all, compatible with the possessor never committing the act for which the devices are preparatory. But such per possession is often in many jurisdictions treated as an independent criminal offense whose proof does not require that the act for which the preparatory offense was preparatory was ever committed. Still, the basic point is that some form of liability for a non-specified um, but already committed act is unlike, unlike, liability for an act likely to lead to some further act. And as a result, the worry about punishment for character or punishment for unacted on thoughts appears to be very much of a misplaced objection. In addition to potentially resembling the problematic category of evidence of character, the aggregation of wrongs 
appears also to resemble even more the equally problematic category of past acts. If, as noted earlier, most developed legal systems, especially in common law jurisdictions, are reluctant, um, although subject to uh, so many exceptions as possibly to undercut the rule, are reluctant to admit evidence uh, of past similar acts that someone charged with committing a wrong has committed, then is not the aggregation of multiple acts analytically similar to the use of past acts? or so it might be argued. But the analogy seems strained. At least part of the concern with the use of past acts is the worry that such use might be the equivalent of multiple or increased punishment for the same act. If committing crime C sub 1 justifies punishment P sub 1, then using the evidence has committed using the evidence that a person has committed C sub 1 in order to prove the commission of crime C sub 2 is equivalent to increasing the punishment for C sub 2 beyond P sub 1. Yet such a concern, however valid in general, seems inapplicable to the case of aggregation of charges, where presumably a finding that some defendant has committed one or more prohibited or liability incurring acts does not entail any increase in the sanction or liability beyond what would have been the case for higher probability proof of a particular act. Although the past acts worry may thus not be especially apt to the question of aggregating probabilities to establish the likelihood of a non-specified act. And so too, perhaps, with the traditional aversion to character evidence. The real problem may, or at least is for some people, the seeming similarity between what we can call aggregation liability and so-called status crimes. Status crimes such as vagrancy, being a drug addict, being a habitual drunkard, or having no visible means of support, do have a long and mostly ugly history. But the aversion to status crimes is often based on the possibility of official abuse, as with the crime of vagrancy, or with challenges to the criminalization, uh, as with the crime of vagrancy, where often the problem is that people who are merely annoying or who merely look different uh, are arrested under the pretense of having committed the crime of vagrancy, and the uh, abuses of such kinds of status crimes have been well documented. There is also a concern with the criminalization of a status that may be beyond the power of the alleged perpetrator to change, or so it is thought, as with some number of drug-related status crimes and with the crime of being without visible means of support. The status crime issue is important, however, because it does raise the question whether there is any difference between the idea of a status crime and the conclusion in the aggregation case that Harvey is potentially being sanctioned for having the status of a sexual assaulter and whether one's, one of Cohen's putative gate crashers is being held liable for having the status of a fraudulent enterer. Under the law of my own state of Virginia, for example, it is a crime to be a habitual drunkard. But would the common skepticism about such crimes be the same if the crime was that of being a habitual murderer or being a habitual rapist? But does it matter? At bottom, the question may be one of the difference, if any, between sanctioning people because they have committed particular murders or because they are murderers. Is there a difference between someone holding someone liable for an act of negligent operation of a motor vehicle on a particular occasion, 
or simply for being a negligent driver? Do we, or should we, distinguish between punishing a person between that person, uh, distinguish between punishing a person because that person has committed this burglary and punishing a person for being a burglar? For many people, the difference between the two is enormous. But on closer inspection, it may well be that the immediate negative reaction to prosecuting or otherwise sanctioning people for what they are in this precise sense, rather than for what they have done on a particular occasion, is in part a product of an aversion to sanctioning people in part for their past acts. But we have just seen that this is a false equivalence. For here the, san here the sanction is not for a past act in this sense, but for a present one even if we do not know exactly which present act is involved. Or it may be that the negative reaction to this form of aggregation stems from a related but different aversion, the aversion to sanctioning people for their character or for their dispositions. But again, as we have seen, the equivalence is a false one because the sanctions under discussion are not sanctions for having a certain character or disposition without evidence of having acted on that character or disposition, as might be the case for sanctioning a person for having a short temper, without evidence that the temper has caused a violent act, or sanctioning people for their sexual proclivities, again, without evidence that they have acted on those proclivities. But when we are talking about aggregation evidence, the putative sanctions are for having committed an act and not just for having the character or disposition to commit one, even if, again, we are not sure exactly which precise act was committed. At the very least, it appears that some of the typical reactions to the form of aggregation under discussion are based on false equivalences or misleading analogies, and that there might be a plausible argument in favor of even criminal prosecution under the circumstances just described. Indeed, in the literature, um, there are some number of stronger arguments for that kind of liability. Uh, it's possible um, that the first one was offered by my uh, then colleague, the economist Richard Zeckhauser, and myself in 1996. Uh, more recently, and it, with much more sophisticated analyses, Eric Posner, Ariel Porat, um, Saul Levmore, uh, and Alon Harrell um, have offered um, persuasive, or at least uh, plausibly persuasive, arguments for this kind of aggregation uh, liability. But it is also likely that some of the typical negative reactions are based on what we can think of as the looming overhang of the criminal process. If we set aside the fears of excess prosecution, we might consider the same question in the context of civil liability rather than criminal punishment. Assuming a preponderance of the evidence, stan preponderance of the evidence standard, the numbers are now different, but the basic analytics with one important qualification are similar. The qualification is that in the civil context, the typical remedy is an award of damages against a particular victim, thus requiring, to continue with the example of Harvey and the five accusers, a particular victim to show that she was the one assaulted and not just that the assault has occurred. That requirement being a function of the underlying, the nature of the underlying cause of action tort in this example, rather than the nature of the legal system. But without this qualification, we might still observe that under a preponderance of the evidence standard, and supposing that each complaint is only 40% persuasive, and thus uh, each um, unable to prove a case individually, the probability that Harvey has committed at least one sexual assault is now one minus um, 
is minus 0.60 um, to the fifth, which is 0.92224. This does not even reach the standard for proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but is still far above the civil standard of proof by a preponderance of the evidence, and thus is still considerably more than probably the case that Harvey has committed at least one act of sexual assault. There, many, there may be many reasons to doubt that it is likely in our lifetimes that the kind of aggregation I am discussing here will ever be part of most developed legal systems, whether in the context of criminal law or even civil liability. But the point of this exercise, even apart from academic, in the best sense uh, of that word and not as a pejorative, even apart from academic interest, is that the issue has important implications in many non-formal or non-judicial administrative contexts, where the question is not the question of civil or criminal sanctions, but instead whether this or that person or entity should receive a license to engage in an activity or lose, lose the license that he, she, or it already has, the question may have special salience. How should an attorney, how should an attorney licensing board deal with an attorney who has been accused by four former clients of financial impropriety? Should a company, three of whose former employees have accused the company of unlawful disposal of pollutants, be subject to sanctions for environmental violations? Should a student who has three times been weakly suspected of cheating be suspended or dismissed, and so on. As the opening example illustrated, the issue is especially relevant in the context of charges of sexual misconduct. Because of the typical lack of witnesses and lack of physical evidence, and because of the sad but still present practice of disbelieving women who make allegations of sexual misconduct. It will often be the case that multiple allegations will individually be inconclusive. But can such individually in, um, inconclusive and perhaps even individually unlikely, albeit not conclusively so, allegations be aggregated for purposes of concluding that the likelihood of truth of one or more, of one or more of them becomes conclusive, as is more than arguably the case with two recent American presidents, a large number of other political figures, even larger numbers of prominent business people, um, an even larger number uh, of equivalently prominent athletes, entertainers, and other celebrities. As a mathematical matter, such aggregation seems the right course when the sanctions are the sanctions of public opinion. But again, the overhang of the criminal law, the mistaken belief that negative judgments in public and private life should mirror the protections of the criminal process is often a distraction. This is not to deny as well that statistical independence, the crucial fact of statistical independence, may be less present in public matters and public life than it is in the statistics books especially when there are personal and political motives, when charges may beget other charges, and when individual charges may lack independence in other ways. When that is the case, unwarranted aggregation may be as much of a problem as underused but statistically warranted aggregation. In an even more pervasive way, the mechanisms that we often describe as rumor or gossip may operate in much the same way, sometimes for good and sometimes for ill. And it is even more often the case that multiple allegations in the domain of social relations, and especially in the new world of social media, no longer share the characteristic of statistical independence, 
without which all of the calculations and all of the analysis I've described become invalid. But on the rare occasions when unsubstantiated rumors come from multiply genuinely independent sources, even the sanctions that ensue from rumor and gossip may as a descriptive matter be based on the aggregation principle discussed um, and may, as a normative matter, in some contexts be better for it. In important respects, this paper, this talk, has not been about evidence at all, with apologies to the organizers. That is, it is about the deep structure of the legal system or perhaps more accurately, about the deep structure of using the legal system to impose sanctions. Insofar as aggregation liability is or is not permissible, it goes to the very question of what we expect the legal system to do, what we expect the legal system to be, how we expect the legal system to deal with sanctions. That is a question much more of substantive law than it is of probability of proof and of evidence, but hopefully the suggestions made here will inspire further discussion, uh, both in the realm of legal liability generally, but also in the realm of thinking about evidence, proof, and probability. Thank you very much. On behalf of everyone here, I would like to thank you for a most suggestive presentation. Allow me a brief reflection and a further example. My reflection concerns the example you give of the 100 murders in New York in December 2017. In this regard, Professor Schauer in my opinion correctly, at least implicitly, distinguishes the notions of the evidence and the evidentiary team. That Smith was here saying he committed one of the murders can be a starting point for the investigation, but not for his conviction. Even if Smith repeated his statement before the magistrate. In the absence of evidence of guilt, a conviction could not be based on the confession of the accused alone, because it is valid as a trial team and is no longer the medieval regina piovrazionum, queen of evidence. And now, my analogous example from the point of view of the presentation, which concerns the question of the so-called alternative fact-finding of the victim. Imagine the presence of toxic substances in the workplace, the exposure to which caused the death of several workers. It is hypothesized that reliable epidemiologic research would allow to affirm the responsibility of the employer for 80% of such events but not to identify the victims of exposure among the aforementioned workers. In this regard, an intense debate is taking place in Italian and German doctrine. Some jurists consider that it is only possible to act for the violation of the rules on the safety and the health of workers. Others, instead, support the legitimacy of arriving at a conviction also for murders, since such offenses would in any case be ascertained beyond any reasonable doubt. So that uh, brings us to the discussion part of the presentation. Uh, please. I wonder, Professor Shah, um, whether there isn't already a form of aggregation in the law. For example, 
a manufacturer of some harmful good has um, only a third of the market. So, so you can see how the question goes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, maybe I should spell yeah. it out. Maybe I should spell it out. Uh, the question is this. A manufacturer of cigarettes uh, has only a third of the market. Let us say that a million people suffered damage from f smoking cigarettes. No one person can prove, even on the balance of probability, that they suffer harm as a result of purchasing the product of this particular company. Yet, this particular company may well ha be held liable in a class action for a third of the damage. Thank you. Yes, I mean, you, for the benefit of uh, at least some people in the audience, uh, You've made reference uh, in part uh, to what, at least in my country, uh, is the case of Sindel versus Abbott Laboratories, a case of the Supreme Court of California uh, involving pharmaceutical liability, um, where, um, again, um, as you correctly say, the question uh, is, should we impose market share liability? Uh, some number of courts have in fact done so, that even if there is no, um, if there is not sufficient proof that a particular corporate defendant has um, caused the injury to a particular injured plaintiff, nevertheless in a class action, market share liability suggests that uh, uh, the damages for the entire class be aggregated uh, and the liability for the class of defendants or a group of defendants be aggregated and liability be imposed on the defendants in proportion to their market share. Uh, I think you are entirely right that this is of the same uh, species of what I am talking about. Uh, Sindel and related issues are controversial. Uh, in my view, uh, it's correctly decided. It is a form of aggregation, although in a slightly different context. Uh, but that form of liability, even if we take away um, the particular issue of uh, corporate uh, transfer of wealth um, from corporations to victims and related kinds of issues. Uh, I think you are right that it's the same problem and that those of us who are sympathetic with market share liability might at least in some context be sympathetic with the kind of aggregation I'm talking about. Well, I... Well, while I have the floor for a moment, let me just respond to one of the uh, things okay. that you said uh, in your uh, commentary. Uh, I think you are right in suggesting that some of this may be more plausible for investigation than for conviction. But then if I can just make reference to the thing that I said at the very end, if there are to be different standards for investigation than for conviction, then it turns out that that's a matter of substantive law rather than a matter of, in a more narrow sense, evidence. Uh, that once the legal system has decided that this kind of evidence would be sufficient to initiate some sort of official inquiry, then the consequences of that inquiry or how far that inquiry should go, as I said at the end, is for me more a question of substantive law than it might be a question of evidence. And indeed, as you uh, suggested, this also may be a particularly important issue when we think not about the legal system officially, but about the behavior of journalists. Um, uh, how should a journalist behave uh, under circumstances of multiple, um, multiple low probability but not zero probability bits of evidence. Okay, in top number one. Okay. Fred, thanks for an interesting discussion. I'm glad to see you bringing your attention to this. I mean, I don't have a settled view about aggregation or disjunctive positive claims, and so I'm anxious to learn more about it, actually. Adrian asked you about the civil side. Let me just ask you about the 
the, the uh, criminal side, um, and I'm just really curious what you think about this point, that the, the criminal side approximates approximation, uh, aggregation. If you take your case of, of Weinstein, um, when you say there's an 80% probability, that's somebody's subjective appraisal of the evidence. If a prosecutor has a person who he thinks he has five cases, each of which the probability is around 0.8, he will bring those cases, and he'll bring them seriatim. So first of all, even if the person is acquitted in the first case, he'll be, he'll be a tried again and again and again and again. And I'm not praising this. That's why I say I'm not sure what my views are. I'm just describing it. Yeah. And if you ask what the probability is of somebody else concluding beyond reasonable doubt in five cases in a row, it's, it's pretty high, um, would be my empirical guess. But then there's, no, there's another overlay to this. Um, as I think you know, and, the, and I'm sure you do, in the criminal cases in particular, the, the character evidence rules are a false promise. And they're particularly a false promise in sexual uh, uh, abuse cases. Um, uh, it, by the way, it turns out that pretty much a false promise everywhere. I mean, if you read, actually read the cases, the ways in which the rules are read to allow prior bad acts to come in, it's quite extraordinary in its creativity. So I would, I mean, my guess is, and who, you know, who am I, but my guess is that there's about a zero probability that he will not be convicted at least once, which approximates, I think, aggregation. I'm just, and you know, a good example of this recently is Bill Cosby. I mean, yeah. it, it just maps straight onto it. Uh, I just, and I, and I don't know what I think about this. Um, and I'm, Need your help. Okay, so um, interestingly, as I, um, for those who've read the paper and, even, and for those who've read the footnotes, uh, as I note in footnote five, as I was writing this, the comedian uh, actor Bill Cosby was convicted in circumstances remarkably similar uh, to my somewhat hypothetical uh, example. One of the interesting things about um, the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus Bill Cosby case uh, is that there were two trials. Uh, and that in the first trial, um, there was uh, a jury that was unable to reach a verdict um, based on primarily the testimony of one alleged victim without the testimony of other alleged victims. In the second trial... I think there was one, one prior bad act. Is that what you mean? One prior bad act was allowed in in the first. But not... And then yet, he, expand, not, you know, he had the victim yeah. testify, and then a prior... Uh, yeah. in, in, a a non-charged victim right. also. But then he expanded it to five the second yeah. time. In, in the second trial, there were, as you say, in the second trial, there were, in fact, five witnesses uh, or five prior bad acts um, under... Uh, rules, for those of you who care, under Rules 413, 414, and 415 of the United States Federal Rules of Evidence, that those uh, would have been admitted in a um, kit trial for sexual misconduct. A few states have adopted similar rules, most have not. Um, the federal rules, uh, federal, the, the federal rules I have just described are largely not completely, largely inapplicable to state, uh, to criminal prosecution in general, as a result of the fact that, at least in the United States, most prosecutions for sexual misconduct take place in state courts rather than in federal courts. Uh, so the controversial rules allowing all of the others uh, in uh, exist. Um, they exist for um, reasons that remain controversial, uh, at least there is the belief that with respect to sexual misconduct, recidivism is more likely than with respect to other crimes. The empirical evidence probably does not support that conclusion. Uh, and the, it is one, one of the reasons that these rules remain controversial is that may, they may be based on empirical evidence about recidivism rates that is somewhere between controversial and false. Uh, nevertheless, um, it is certainly true, including multiple prosecutions using bad acts in other forms, that once again, uh, in criminal context, some of this may take place more than we actually think, 
insofar that as in trials number two, three, four, and five, some of this evidence may in fact come in. If in fact it's exist, it, it is extant for both civil cases and criminal cases, then maybe one of the things uh, to do or one of the things to think about with respect to aggregation uh, is to make somewhat more official and therefore somewhat more controlled and constrained what's now going on anyway. Um, but uh, I appreciate what both of you have said um, insofar as it may be, uh, I may be too quick to assume that this is not happening and maybe more thought needs to be given. How is it happening indirectly? And if we, may, if we were more explicit about what is happening indirectly, we might be better able to use it, but also better able to control it. Professor Schauer, congratulations on this brave lecture. Uh, I was wondering if it's possible to uh, expand your ideas also to, the, uh, to distribute the liability uh, and to, to compensate the victims uh, when you don't know exactly who suffered what. So you could pay the five Harvey victims uh, shares that are proportional to, to uh, as, as if they were a group, not knowing exactly who suffered which part of the damage. And in criminal cases, I believe uh, when we are dealing with organized crime, we also have some kind of group, res group, group criminal responsibility that would uh, benefit from your accounts. Thank you. Thank you. So your first suggestion um, overlaps with Professor Zuckerman's suggestion uh, about market share liability. Uh, as I understand you, uh, you are suggesting maybe we should take that a little bit further uh, and we should at least think about the analogy with market share liabilities with respect to um, maybe even one individual, not one corporation, one individual uh, who might have um, to a uh, less than sufficient probability committed multiple wrongs. Um, I am somewhat sympathetic with that for the same reason that I am somewhat sympathetic um, in broadly speaking cases of statistical um, evidence, um, broadly speaking sympathetic to the possibility of expected value liability. Um, this uh, would be the basis for another talk uh, and a, perhaps a conclusion even more controversial, uh, but one of the quirks of many civil liability systems, um, if I can use probabilities again here, is that if the plaintiff uh, proves her or his case to a 0.51 probability, the plaintiff will recover all of the plaintiff's damages. If the plaintiff recover, uh, proves her or his case to a 0.49 probability, the plaintiff recovers nothing. Um, that. Uh, Statisticians would find this weird. Uh, whether we should find this weird um, is an interesting and important question. There is something about the legal system that has a particular all or nothing character, um, but maybe it's, maybe the kinds of things I'm saying about and others have said about aggregation, the kinds of things that st statisticians and others might be saying about expected value liability might be generalized even more. Um, if there is, uh, I'll put it more controversially without endorsing it one way or another, um, if there is a 40% chance that I have um, caused um, you uh, to be harmed in the amount of um, 10,000 euros, should I be required to pay you 4,000 euros? Uh, some would say, no, I probably didn't do it. I shouldn't have to pay you anything. Others would say uh, the principles of expected value apply or maybe should apply in law uh, as elsewhere. It is, as you properly say, part of the same topic. I mean, okay. Thank you, Professor Schauer. Uh, 
at the end of your presentation, uh, you said that uh, speaking in realistic terms, um, this uh, aggregation exercise uh, could have important implications in a non-formal or non-judicial context. Uh, my question is uh, very simple. What would be the relevance of the so-called extra procedural aspect or dimension of the principle of innocence, the presumption of innocence? Yeah. I mean, uh, not understood as a rule within a judicial process, but as a principle according to which every person has to be treated as innocent until a judge or a tribunal declares his or her responsibility, not just in uh, administrative, sanctionatory proceedings, but also in uh, private contexts. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so, I mean, the, there has been a fair amount, some of it skeptical, uh, written about the presumption of innocence in general. Uh, that is, in a typical cri criminal trial, if we were to take the idea of the presumption of innocence totally seriously, uh, it would mean that the prior probability, uh, to put it in Bayesian terms, the prior probability that a defendant is guilty is one out of whatever the population of the earth is, six billion. Uh, we don't operate that way, we don't believe that, uh, that and so on. Um, so we, um, coming back then to your question about what is the relevance of the presumption of innocence for the non-judicial, non-formal behavior uh, of individuals when they condemn others uh, and the like, um, it seems to me that it may be appropriate to start with some rough equivalent to a presumption of innocence, but it wouldn't take very much to raise it beyond that. I think when most people um, in popular discourse refer to the presumption of innocence, they mean something much stronger. Uh, what they really mean is when, or that is, when people complain that we shouldn't criticize others unless we have overcome the presumption of innocence. What they really mean is we shouldn't criticize others, we shouldn't refuse to hire others, we shouldn't refuse to vote for people, and so on, and so on, and so on, unless we have something equivalent to proof beyond the reasonable doubt or something of that variety. Um, I want to resist all of that. Um, it seems to me um, I occasionally uh, get criticized for giving examples about children uh, because I am a childless only child, so I know nothing about children and nothing about raising them. Uh, but at least we might want to consider the question in the context of what would it take to get you to refuse to hire a babysitter that you were otherwise considering hiring? Um, uh, and once we think about an example of that variety, it then turns out that the overhang of, of what I call the overhang of the criminal process may at times be um, more troubling um, or more distracting than it ought to be. So yes, I think as a matter of rationality, maybe we shouldn't make decisions unless we have um, some evidence. But of course, with virtually every decision that we make, we have base rate evidence. So the idea of there being a base rate, the idea of we know nothing about the particular case, uh, but we know something um, about, by way of generalization about the particular case, that's evidence. Um, so, um, when we think about, for example, um, should we, um, under what circumstances um, should I accept a ride from someone who is in a very, very high-powered car, uh, painted in bright colors, and has written on the side of the car, built to speed? Uh, um, and maybe it's, a, um, maybe it's a car capable of, uh, that I know, um, capable of uh, going at 300 kilometers per hour. Uh, I have a fair amount of base rate evidence, and that's evidence. Uh, now, if we want to say that base rate evidence is not evidence, then we're into a different discussion. But it seems to me that the 
understanding of base rate evidence, which involves admitting that we are often, especially in per personal contexts, justified in relying on probabilities, on profiles, on stereotypes, and so on, may be justified. That is, there may be very good reasons, I think there are very good reasons, for ignoring stereotypes and ignoring profiles when they involve issues of race and gender and other characteristics, but we profile and stereotype in our daily lives all the time. We take base rates into account all the time, and that may be uh, inconsistent with the idea of a presumption of innocence uh, in a strong sense. Thank you, thank you, Professor. I'm Javier Munera. I come from Colombia. I'm a lawyer. And I think that I share practically 100% all your presentation, most especially. Uh, it's really been kind of something intense to listen to you, and it's really made me react. At the end of my words, you'll see how much it coincides with a novel, a novel of Garcia Marquez and about the legal system. You say that the, the legal criminal system through legal provisions has to actually rule and prevent that such events can and such protected values of people and societies can affect so many. So I'm with you. And I'm quoting Garcia Marquez, the Colombian writer, because in his novel, Chronicle of an Announced Death, the protagonist, Santiago Nassar, was murdered because he robbed caresses, virginities, and kisses. In 24 hours, his murderers traveled through the municipal geography yelling to people that he had to be killed and that death could not be prevented because no one, not either the legal system, was dynamic and efficient enough and the people could not prevent that death because of the circumstances of the contingency. I'm using this quote of the novel of, of Garcia Marquez because I think that the legal criminal system has really to act intensely to end once and for all the possibility that uh, knowing people because of the way they act, they are not allowed to be witnesses. And we, by saying that they below zero in moral stature of somebody who's been a murderer and somebody who's been sentenced in 2,000 cases of declared death, it happens in my country. We have people in the government. We have people, a person that was sentenced on the basis he was the head of the cartel of Medellin, Pablo Escobar, and then that man went on to declare on oath, and his declaration was the relevant, crucial evidence to condemn someone else when we all knew what his nature was. And theoretically, uh, well, there was a lot there. We knew about the intellectual authorship. What I mean by this is that the legal criminal system really has to start qualifying the basis of moral rules, the inability and the inadmissibility of a person that is able to killed 2,000 people, and we have to prevent that person from being a witness. So then there, the, yes, there has to be a standard of proof, a clear standard of proof that makes it impossible for people like that to be witnesses of anything, any circumstance of the phenomenic world. I would like to hear your opinion, please, on whether this is then not a fortunate circumstance for the legal system, finally, to find the way to determine and qualify this and see when we admit a witness like this? So, I am not going, to, I, I do not have the capability to comment on Colombian criminal procedure, uh, and I have the good sense not to do so, uh, but I think the underlying issue um, is an important one. That is, although I didn't mention it when I was talking about character evidence, at least in the legal systems that I know best, 
One of the reasons, uh, and not the ones I mentioned, one of the reasons why we exclude sometimes some character evidence is because of fear of its overuse. And indeed, a fair number of rules of evidence, one explanation of the hearsay rules may be of this variety, one explanation of some of the character rules may be of this variety, is that for fear that certain characteristics may be overused, we mandate their underuse. So it may be that at least one of the justifications for the exclusion of past acts, for the exclusion of character evidence, for the exclusion of what we know, um, is that there may be possibly in some um, systems too much of an inclination uh, of fact finders, whether they be judges or juries, too much of an inclination to think once a murderer, always a murderer, once a thief, always a thief, and so on. If people who are making decisions engage too often in those forms of inferences, one compensating, one way of compensating for that is mandatory underuse to compensate for expected overuse. Uh, whether the compensation is too much may vary with the system, uh, but the fact that the prohibitions on character and the prohibitions on past act, acts may exclude genuinely relevant evidence is an expected consequence of a rule that's worried about overuse and tries to deal with it through underuse. Whether that's the Colombian case, I won't say. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, Fred. Uh, I would like to raise a, a philosophical question that you dodged a little. And um, you, you correctly pointed out that in uh, the, the, the criminal law in, in almost every legal system punishes individuals for particular acts, but does not punish individuals for belonging to a certain group or being of a certain kind. And that's perfectly correct. Now, the, the philosophical question is, uh, I think we all accepted that, but, and it seems reasonable, but the philosophical question is, why? What's the justification for only punishing people for uh, specific acts? And it seems to me that there could be a variety of different justifications depending on your view of punishment. For example, Bentham would say something along these lines, well, it's unacceptable to punish people if there is no deterren deterrence effect. And therefore, uh, we cannot punish people for belonging to a group or being a certain kind of person because that wouldn't have any deterring effect because I mean, if someone would see that happening, uh, I, it wouldn't give them any reason to refrain from committing criminal acts because whether they commit the act or not, they still belong to that group and they're still that kind of person. So uh, that would be kind of Benthamite argument for, for justification for why we should only punish individuals for singular acts. And then if you're, I mean, if you're a Kantian or something, you would probably make up some kind of argument based on autonomy that we're autonomous people, so therefore we can only punish people if they have chosen to, to do something that's morally wrong and not because they belong to a group or whatever. So what's, what's your view on that? Okay, so, uh, good. Um, uh, you, you are right that I dodged it, but I think I intentionally invited it, or I invited the inquiry. That's the obvious uh, implication of what I'm saying. The Benthamite deterrence view, obviously, is an empirically contingent view. Uh, the more interesting question is, what would a Kantian or a retributivist or some, someone like that say? Um, now, uh, if the Kantian or the retributivist wants to say we should only punish people for doing wrong, then it seems to me that the retributivist might be slightly more sympathetic to what I am at least suggesting uh, than others. After all, uh, if we are uh, convinced beyond a reasonable doubt 
that someone has committed at least one grave moral wrong, even if we cannot identify it then the retributivist ought to be comfortable with punishing that person even if we cannot identify the act. That's what I was trying to suggest a little bit when I, some of the things I talked about bad acts or character, that we're not really talking about punishing people for what they are. We are talking people uh, about punishing people for having committed a bad act, a morally culpable act, even if we cannot specify with precision which morally culpable act. So uh, I don't think there's any hope that this will actually happen, but I think the retributivists ought to be somewhat comfortable with, uh, or somewhat more comfortable with aggregation liability than the immediate reaction of some of my retributivist colleagues might suggest. Last uh, question. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I have two questions. First of all, I think that your position is based on the supposition that five wrongdoings uh, are committed, but it's the same illicit act. So what would happen in the case in which the probability of any one uh, immoral act were not sufficient for condemning, but the probability that, uh, I don't know, one of five has been committed between, I don't know, robbery or burglary or whatever. Well, let us imagine that any one act committed, yes, goes beyond the standard, beyond any reasonable doubt. And then my second question related to the first is, OK, well, let's imagine it's the same crime, the five acts uh, why the person is investigated or rape, for example, the rape offense, but these didn't necessarily take place in the same circumstances. So the judge will have to individualize the sentence, minimum or maximum sentence, and the judge will have to decide between, I don't know, 10 years or 20 years imprisonment, well, how much is going to be given, yeah? So how is the judge going to be able to individualize uh, the, the sentence if all he knows is that possibly one at least of those crimes was committed, but he doesn't know which? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, the possibility that there may be different wrongs or differently specified wrongs is the way that the problem that I'm talking about has been presented in the recent past in these articles that I mentioned by Ariel Porat, Alon Harrell, uh, Eric Posner, and a few others. That is uh, the possibility that uh, somebody was killed, but we don't exactly know which in which way. We know that somebody was uh, killed by being hit over the head, but we don't know whether they were hit over the head by a brick um, or by a candle holder uh, or something of that variety. So um, the question of different acts is very close but not identical to the question of differently specified acts, which is how the problem has traditionally um, been presented. Um, this may, uh, in a way, go back to Christian Dalman's uh, question about retributivism uh, and so on. If we are pretty convinced that one of them happened, does the fact that we cannot specify which one or even specify which way uh, make um, a huge amount of difference, and I think in many contexts, once again, even if we put aside if we put aside the criminal law, in many contexts, um, it may be that we are comfortable saying, as long as we're pretty convinced that it was one of these, we shouldn't be overly concerned about which one. Uh, that's the strong position, uh, and I think most of us do that in our everyday lives. And then the question of whether what we do in our everyday lives should carry over what the criminal law, to what the criminal law should do is a substantive question and not an evidentiary question, uh, recognizing that the line between the two is somewhere between fragile and non-existence. Uh, on your second question, um, it is a very useful supplement uh, to what um, Ron Allen and Adrian Zuckerman pointed out before, that is, to what extent are we already doing this? Uh, 
Uh, and sentencing may be a pretty good example of the fact that this is what we are already doing. Um, that uh, aggregate liability taking into account previous acts and things of that sort is a very common feature of sentencing, even if it is not a very common feature of the initial determination of guilt. Um, so um, again, what a uh, decision maker knows at the time of sentencing obviously varies with different systems and it varies with whether there's a jury, it varies with whether there are sentencing guidelines and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but some of what I am suggesting does take place, at least in um, the countries I know best, at the sentencing phase, even if in theory we are resistant to it uh, at the guilt finding phase. And uh, although my suggestions are at best tentative, um, I wouldn't resist taking much of this into account at the sentencing phase. Okay. Uh Thank you, Professor Schauer, also for, for your uh, answers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.